Um, I got to tell you, the topic that we're looking at is very scriptural and biblical. Uh, Friday, we were flying back to our old hometown. A dear, one of the sweetest, most wonderful men I've ever known in my life, Pastor Lynn. Uh, you guys know he passed away a couple weeks ago, and so we went back uh, for the service. I'm, I'm amazed we're here last night. It was going along, and the flight was delayed, flight was delayed, flight was delayed. I was like, oh my gosh, we're not going to make it back. And then, and then finally we get on the airplane. It's like, okay, we'll land by midnight. That's fine. And if you were awake last night, you saw the lightning. Well, apparently our pilot was afraid to fly in lightning. I don't know. <laughs> so they diverted to uh, Salt Lake City around 1 a.m. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> And uh, so got home and went to sleep around 4 o'clock this morning, and here we go. But I'm telling you, man, this is either just the most exciting topic in the world or God is good. Uh, If I say silly things, just we're the family of God, give me a little grace. Uh, But it was so fun starting the study on the airplane on Friday, being in the clouds, reading about the rapture and his soon return. I was like, I might beat them. I'm already halfway here. Uh, (laughs) That didn't happen, so we'll learn about it. Uh, But look, the reality is it's important to understand that we're to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's also important to understand why. There is something throughout Scripture, there's a time coming that's foretold or prophesied of that has not yet taken place. In the Old Testament, it's known as the time of Jacob's trouble, Uh, Throughout the New Testament and into the book of Revelation, we call it the tribulation period. It's seven years. It's the only piece of Daniel's prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. But there's not just some random thing that's going to happen. There's a particular purpose for these seven years or the tribulation. It's not something that anyone came up with or a theologian wants to be true. You just read the Bible and grab what it says, whether it's comfortable or not. And the two things that the tribulation deals with is the portion of the unfulfilled but soon to be fulfilled part of God's promise specifically to Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. Israel does not replace the church. God has a very specific purpose for her in the times to come. And so the tribulation period is a fulfillment of God's promise to his chosen people. And then second is God's wrath is poured out upon the unrighteousness and sinfulness of the world. It's going to happen. It's not probably going to happen. It's not a fictitious story. It is a fact that these things will take place. I love thinking about the love and the mercy and the grace of God, but it's important to also understand he's not just love and grace and mercy and then, you know, his wrath a little bit. When it comes, it comes in its fullness. And it comes in his holiness, which means it is actually right that it would take place. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 19 it says, beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Don't do it. Don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. A portion of that being exercised will be during that tribulation period. If you go back into the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, chapter 103, Verse 9, God says, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. In fact, the Bible says the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Why are we not consumed? Great question. The Bible says the reason you and I are not consumed, there's one, do you know what, there's only one reason, is because of his mercies. He could crush and chooses not to. But don't think he never will. He has just stayed his hand until his chosen and appointed time. Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, Jesus is speaking and sharing about this end time, the tribulation. He says, for there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, 
the flood doesn't even compare. Not the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. It's going to happen. If you've shied away from the book of Revelation for some reason, don't. Lean in, read it, and there's very simple rules. When you read the Bible, it's very simple. People get lost in turning certain things that are logical and uh, real and applicable to spiritual, and, and they make it allegorical, and well, that's not what it means. It means something else. When the Bible says it means something, it means something. If it's trying to paint a picture, it paints a picture. If it's literal, it's literal, meaning this. If the Bible, specifically in the book of Revelation, says that God is going to pour out his wrath, then that means he's going to. Well, I don't, that's not comfortable. That's okay. In fact, we should understand what it means to fear the Lord. You don't have to be afraid of him if you're saved by Christ, but to have a fear or a reverence towards him. Now, there's parts, though, that are a little bit illustrative, where the, the picture's being painted by words, where John, in the book of Revelation, he's really struggling to find a language that could articulate what he's seeing. I mean, come on, he's seeing future things and divine moments. And so he says, oh, goodness, the throne room, it's like there's a rainbow. It doesn't mean there is. A, it's like a rainbow, but it's all emerald and greens in its colors. Or things are like a Sardis stone. He's trying to say there's this appearance of this solid, translucent, beautiful, mysterious. I can't find the words. It's, it's not a Sardis stone. It's like a Sardis stone. And so when the Bible uses words like this is what it's like, then it's painting you a picture so you can understand. Pause and let your mind's eye understand what God's saying. He gives you word pictures for a reason. But then when he just gives you absolute statements of fact, then they are just simply absolute statements of fact. And so as you read through the Bible, there is an absolute revealed timeline to these things that it's important to understand. We're going to go pretty quickly. Every one of these could be a study or two in and of themselves. But I don't know why I do this. I like to work backwards. Let's start at the end. How does this whole thing end? Great question. For you and I, it ends quite well. But it ends... <laughs> in eternity with the new heavens and the new earth. Now, people ask all the time, God's going to tear down his own throne and build a new one? Know this. And sometimes cults kind of get this twisted up because in the Bible it talks about the heavens, plural. And they'll come up with a religion or a system of belief that there's layers to this divine place, but that's not it. It simply breaks the heavens into three categories. There's the atmosphere, kind of where the birds fly and the clouds float. Then there's the second heaven, which is the outer space or the universe where the stars and the planets are. And then the third heaven would simply be the throne room or the divine location of God. And so you have these multiple heavens. When it says a new heaven and a new earth, where God is, his throne's fine. But everything from that point down is going to be completely burned up and made new. So in the end, eternity, new heavens, new earth, right before that, like, well, what's happening? The great white throne judgment. It's right near the end of the book of Revelation. Don't worry, you and I won't be there. This is for those who died not putting their faith in the Lord. There is a bodily resurrection of them as well. And those bodies are transformed and they are eternal and the suffering never ends. And the books are open and they give an account. And a part of that, every opportunity they had to accept the Lord and chose not to. Romans says they will be without excuse and then enter into judgment. Before that is the millennial reign. You and I will be there. This is, we'll be part of this. This is where Jesus for a thousand years is on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, actually, not just allegorically. We rule and reign with him. Uh, you'll, right before that, what kind of ushers all this in, and it happens really quickly, is that Satan's bound up. Um, Satan's locked up in a pit, and thus it can be paradise on earth for the thousand years. 
If someone were to die at 100, it'd be like they were a child. Right before that, almost simultaneously, these three like dominoes hit pretty quick, but the second coming of Christ. He comes and with the authority of just his word, they go out like swords and annihilate and demolish anything that's left of sinful nature. It's wild. Prior to that is what we've touched on, the seven-year tribulation. These seven years, the first half deception, the second half absolute wrath and judgment. But look, here's the deal. God is not going to beat up his bride to take her home. That would be the strangest, most abusive relationship on planet Earth. Like, hey, we're going to spend eternity together, but I'm just going to punch you a few times real hard. And so the purpose of the tribulation is to deal with the unfulfilled portions of the promise to Israel and to pour out judgment on unrighteousness. But before he does that, he removes the church. You're his bride. Simultaneously, while the wrath is happening on earth, there's the wedding supper of the lamb. There's the bema seat or the rewards that are given out in heaven. It's this beautiful thing up top while judgment is happening down below and thus the rapture. Now, what's, what's going on? Where are we at? Well, we're right before the rapture. Here we have the church age or the day of grace is what it's known in theology. It's a season of time from basically the birth of Christ until the reign, the day of the Lord. So right now we're in the day of grace. Well, it seems so different than the Old Testament. It is because Christ came, he brought the covenant with him or a new covenant and changed it. And so you have the birth of Christ, which really brought us what we know as the New Testament. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, new to Christianity, your Bible's broken up into everything before Jesus and everything after Jesus. So that's your Old Testament and New Testament. And then simply put, speaking of the Old Testament, kind of everything that's happened from Christ backwards, which ultimately for us begins with creation. Like, well, the line kind of keeps going in the other direction. That's because God's always been. What was he doing? No idea. But you were part of his plan and his desire, so thus creation sprung into existence. To be removed from those years of judgment and deception, John chapter 14, you should be there in your Bibles, the first four verses, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in me, or in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So many neat things in these couple of verses, but he says, in my father's house are many mansions. Now, I don't know about you, living in a mansion in heaven doesn't actually sound super appealing. Have you ever been in a huge house all alone? It's super cool for like the first movie. And then you're like, oh, this is kind of lonely. This is kind of hollow, kind of weird, kind of spooky. What's articulated in the original language is not that we each have this massive property, but it's one enormous grand structure with many rooms. You've actually already been in a version of one, whether you know it or not. Anyone ever stay in a hotel on vacation? Massive grand building, but all of these independent self-contained places. And so you are in your place, but still connected together. But you don't live there for all of eternity. You're just there for a moment. And so for those seven years, we are in this enormous, grand, beautiful structure that Jesus is preparing at this very moment, and we will inhabit one day. The eternal portion is when it all comes back to the new earth amongst the new heavens. But I go prepare a place for you. And he says, if I go prepare a place for you, don't you love Jesus? He's like, look it, if it was another way, I would just tell you it's another way. I'll tell you how it's going to be. This is actually what is happening. This too is not allegorical or some idea, some, some facade or wish list. This is what's taking place in heaven right now. Great, sign me up. 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself. This is a huge statement. If you've ever watched football, right, there's two ways that the ball moves down the field. Either someone behind the quarterback runs to him, gets the ball, and then takes off. The other is someone runs down the field and the ball is thrown to them, the receiver, and they catch it. Jesus says, I'm not going to come back to the earth and grab you. I'm going to receive you to myself. Somehow, we're like the ball where it's being tossed downfield, except for you and I, we meet him in the air, in the clouds. We'll read about this in a moment. But Jesus says, I am coming again, and I will receive you to myself. Now, some interesting questions should come to mind. Like, hold on. First of all, this sounds wild. Like, yes, it does. Any of you guys ever those flying dreams and you wake up like startled? It's we- I'm weird. I actually like those dreams. I don't get it. But one day we're 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 going to be instantaneously caught up. Like, whoa! And you're there. I don't like heights. It's only going to be like a half of half of a second. A trumpet will sound and. You're there. It's be incredible. But you ask these questions, right? How is this going to happen? What will it be like? And when might all of this take place? Three really good questions. I'm glad you asked. The Bible answers. You guys can turn your Bibles over to that next marked location, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As you guys are going, it's important to know the book of Thessalonians, especially the first letter, it was not just an old guy named Paul who felt like writing some things down. He wasn't just rambling on and and just kind of whimsically grabbing topics that he thought were fun to write about. He was actually responding to questions that the church had. In Acts chapter 17, Paul, Silas, and Timothy go into town for the very first time with the gospel. And they share the gospel, and it says many people were beginning to get saved, and this church comes to being, but they're only able to stay there for three weeks because of this huge riot that broke out. They had to leave for their own lives' sake. But Paul has this strange love for this little church that he only got to spend a little bit of time with. So eventually he sends Timothy back. He's like, go see how they're doing. Timothy goes back. He hangs out with them for a while. And when they do reconnect, he comes back to Paul. He says, look, this this church, they get it. They really get it. The gospel, they received it. They're still standing strong. In fact, it's growing. And the word, it's gone out or to other neighboring communities and villages. But they have questions, Paul. They they remember the gospel. They, They know the deity of Christ. They know that they're saved by grace and not by works. It's beautiful. But they remember you talking something about the coming of the Lord or the rapture and that that some people wouldn't die, but they've had to have some funerals and they're burying people, so now they're worried. Did, Did they not understand you or did they miss it? And so Paul begins to write back to them. And in that, he's not just randomly grabbing this strange made up topic. He's dealing with something he told them about and is now reaffirming and including himself in. This is the fun part. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, my brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or they've, they've died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep or have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or have passed away. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What an interesting portion of Scripture. 
But he says something. We're saying this to you by the word of the Lord. The idea that most people believe this to be is this is something Jesus taught us. Now, the Gospels don't contain every conversation Jesus had with everyone. John's Gospel says, oh my, if we were going to do that, there's not enough books in the world to contain it. And so Paul says, what I'm giving you is something the Lord gave us. This was one of those side conversations that was actually had. Jesus told us about this. We're not making it up. But don't be ignorant of those who have fallen asleep. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Has anyone in here ever lost someone you love dearly? Did you not grieve? Absolutely we grieve. Sorrow is a part of even the believer's life, but it's a different kind of sorrow. Those who don't know the Lord, don't have security and hope in eternity, they'll begin to grab onto interesting superstitions and practices. Maybe I can do something here that will influence them there, and that's not how it works. But the lack of peace drives them to try Makes sense. I get it. It doesn't work. It's not true. But you can understand. He says, but the church, God's people, we have security. We have hope. We know the truth. They're just asleep for a moment. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They're conscious in the presence of God, worshiping with angels. Can't wait to see what that's like. But for the believer, you, know, you go to bed every night, right? It's like you almost like you died of consciousness. And then you wake up. And you, you are having a little mini resurrection every morning. Woohoo! You're, you're here. <laughs> but, but for that moment, they're gone. He says, but don't worry. They're going to come back. They're going to resurrect. There's going to be a resurrection. We have hope. Just yesterday morning, we were part of that Day celebrating the life of Pastor Lynn, and there was way more joy than there was grief. It was wild. Whatever Pastor Lynn said, you kind of sort of did. And he said, when I die, you're all wearing Hawaiian. So there were like a thousand people wearing Hawaiian. It's kind of weird. Never been to a funeral like that, and yet it was glorious. To have nothing but overflowing hope and a, a, a few sad tears for self. I'll miss them, but that's it. Absolute peace and security. They're just gone for a moment. We don't say goodbye. It's just, see you later. In fact, we'll see you in the clouds soon and very soon. But verse 17 of what we just read, Paul includes himself, we who are alive and remain. There was this great expectation that Paul had that he could come back at any minute, any day the Lord might show up. Even myself might be included in those who don't pass away. Well, it's been a 1,000 years. Yeah, that's true. It's been 2,000 years. Yeah, it's true. It's been, uh, but make no mistake, he's coming. And it could be at any moment. There's nothing that has to happen before the rapture takes place, before we are caught up, as 1 Thessalonians here says. It hints at the imminency or the immediate opportunity of the rapture. But I love this, that the, the rapture is very personal to the Lord. It should be personal to you, but it's also personal to him. He's not going to send an Uber driver. Right? He's not sending an angel to pick you guys up and take you home. He says, I myself am coming. I want to pick you up. I want to meet you in the clouds. I'm going to do this. And I will receive you to myself. And I will bring with him the dead in Christ, they shall rise first. He is coming, and we are rising. But the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That's interesting. Why do the dead have to rise first? Well, the jokesters would say it's because they have six feet further to go. <laughs> They're like, okay. Now, I'm not super fond of graveyards and cemeteries, but it would be pretty neat to be walking by one the moment the trumpet sounds and the rapture happens. Like, whoa, whoa! Like, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be incredible. But people get a little bit tripped on, up on this, and, and understandably so, right? We talked about what this is going to be like, but we can discover more and more and more because, like, hold on a second. Like, someone's in the ground, their body's decaying, maybe already has... My grandfather, if I remember correctly, uh, he was cremated and, and it wasn't necessarily sure where to put his ashes. So he, part of him's on top of Mount Whitney, 
Part of him's under an oak tree in Temecula, and I'm pretty sure part of him is just out in the ocean having a great time. Like, well, what's going to happen to him? When the trumpet sounds, somehow God collects all of who you were in the grave or spread out all over and breathes life into it, and there they are. Oh, come on. Can God do that? My God can. I mean, Adam was just a collection of dirt in the first place anyways, wasn't he? Why couldn't God do it again? He'll do it again. He promised. This, it's not just this made-up idea. It's what the Word teaches, that we will be transformed, that this is going to happen, and it could happen at any minute. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20 the second to last verse in the whole Bible says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Yes, even so, come Lord Jesus. Now when he says quickly, you're like, it's been a long time. Peter warned about that kind of thinking. Well, grandma thought he was going to come. Careful. Peter says, oh yeah, they'll say, oh, this is the promise since the beginning. But look, where is he? Like, when you call the cops, don't they show up in great speed? Lights and sirens, 100 miles an hour, come flying around the corner. Jesus didn't say, behold, I'm coming soon. He said, I'm coming quickly. It means when it happens, it happens fast. The Bible describes that the whole thing takes about a half a second, the twinkling of an eye, and it's over. If you're like, I'm going to wait till I hear the trumpet, and then I'll go. No, you won't. You'll be wondering where everyone went. And you will inherit the tribulation period. Well, I'll get saved during the tribulation period. Some people will, absolutely. But those who knew about Christ before, it says a delusion will fall upon your mind. And it is highly unlikely that you would choose Jesus then if you don't choose Jesus now. Be careful. Well, you know the word rapture is not in the Bible. That's true. Neither is the word Bible. Neither is the word Trinity. But the book of Ephesians is the most Trinity-rich portions of Scripture we have. Neither is dinosaur. But read Job chapter 40. There's lots of words that aren't in the Bible that are absolutely divine truth. The word rapture comes out of Latin, but caught up here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, to be caught up, harpazo, is the Greek, rapturo is the Latin. It means to seize, to carry off, to snatch out of the way. Instantly, quickly, with intentionality. The book of Jude is another place this word's used, and it it describes quite clear, save others. Some before this says, be gentle, be kind, be gracious in, in sharing the gospel, but others save by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Look, if someone was in a burning building, are you like, excuse me, can you just, can I just pick you? I don't want to, I don't want to get your shirt dirty. Ah, like, no way. You might get cut and scraped. Your shirt's going to get torn, but you're getting out of the building. Let's go. And the Lord is like, my wrath is coming upon unrighteousness. I have unfinished business and you're, you're going caught up, removed. In the twinkling of an eye. But comfort each other. Comfort each other is the instructions. Well, how, how's this going to happen? I mean, this is, this is wild. There's a grand transformation that takes place. That's 1 Corinthians 15. You can turn your Bibles over. What's it going to be like? This is a bit of a, an answer or a description. We're not zombies, like, resurrected. Like this. It's beautiful. But there has to be a change, both of the dead and of the living. If you think about this, there's many issues with you going to heaven as you are. But one of them, if you went in this body, you'd be in heaven until you had a natural heart attack. Well, how fun would that be? You'd be in heaven until... Your mind gave out. You'd be in heaven until you got cancer. You'd be in heaven until... This body ain't going to work. It doesn't... This is not going to last. I mean, eternity is a long time. And so we kind of understand the concept. If you went to the beach, you could try and hold your breath for as long as possible, or you could get a scuba tank and be down for hours. 
but something has to change about the situation in order to last longer. And so these bodies, destroyed by the fallen world in which we live in, they can't inherit eternity, so something's got to change. 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about these bodies being kind of like a seed in the idea, the illustration. If you put an acorn in the ground, what are you planting? Technically, just an acorn. It becomes an oak tree. In the same way you just put a kernel of corn in the ground, you get the whole plant. It starts small, and as it dies, it becomes something grand and powerful. These bodies, though they are frail and weak and temporary, in this moment of transformation, they become something grand and glorious and unending. It's neat. 1 Corinthians 15, he already gives the illustrations about the seed example. And then verse 42 says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, that's this, and there is a spiritual body, that's what's to come. It's the same molecules, just restructured. It describes right now as what is corruption and dishonor and weakness. <laughs> Does anyone realize this body is maybe not what you want forever? I mean, I'm good. We could go anytime. It, it's, it's, it's over. But I love what it says. There's a transformation. Corruption becomes incorruptible. What is dishonored becomes glory. What was weak becomes powerful. There's words in here that talk about the stains and the scars of our sins will be gone. The dishonor. Look, have you met people who are scarred inside or out because of the life they've lived? Even people who have used substances, drugs, or alcohol, and it's changed. They're just, they're not the person they once were. But if they come to faith in Christ, however much he restores them here, he will fully restore him then. They will be in their right mind. They will be of their right body. It was so wild and humbling. I remember we took a bunch of junior hires to a retirement center uh, out near Las Vegas one year, and it was craft time. And there was a portion of this retirement center uh, that took a, of adults who had special needs. And so it was craft time, and I took maybe four or five of the kids in there, and we were hanging out helping with crafts. And I was just trying to come up with something. something like we're here for the Lord, right? I mean, I love just being comforting is great, but we got to do something. So there's a young man. No, sorry, he wasn't young at all. Um, special needs, couldn't talk super well. So I was like, I'm going to ask him if he knows about the Bible. Do you know about the Bible? We're making a craft. He's like, yes. Okay. What's your favorite story? I'm thinking, I'm going to minister to him. I'll tell him his favorite Bible story. Is it David and Goliath? Is it, so what's your favorite part of the Bible? He says, oh, the part where you get new bodies. Isn't that wild? Amazing. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, all is made right. All is renewed and made whole. Not all will sleep. Some of us will be transformed as is. I'm okay not having to die. I can do that. Now, some people might say, like, well, you're just an escapist. Like, hey, look, if you're saying I don't have to get pummeled, I'll take it. But I didn't come up with it. It's not because I want it to be true. It's because the Bible says it. 2 Corinthians 5.1, talking about this change, says, for we know that if our earthly house, he talks about your body as a tent, this tent, Anyone like to go camping? I love camping. Anyone want to live in a tent forever? The rain comes through sometimes. The wind shakes the whole thing. The ground is not not that soft on day four. This tent's tired. You can have it. For we know that if our earthly house, this body, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, I'm not sure who came up with this saying. It doesn't make sense. Like, oh, you guys are just trying to get out of it. You you, you just don't want to suffer for the Lord. Well, you're kind of right. I'd like to not suffer. But I will if we have to. 
Nowhere in the Bible is someone saying like, ooh, me, me, I want to suffer, pick me. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing. David didn't necessarily show up like, ooh, I just hope to fight a giant today. But he was willing. Paul wasn't, you know, pumped or stoked in Maui terms about having his head removed, but he was willing. Where to be willing? Look, he's almost back. The Lord could come back right now. Right now, go for it, all in. What are we hanging on to that's so fascinating? We're going to get to heaven and see all the stuff we hung on to was garbage. Grab on to eternity. It's almost here. So heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, some would say. Like, I think it's quite the opposite. If we're heavenly minded enough, we'll be very earthly good. The whole substance of this chapter in 1 Corinthians, it says, the Lord is coming. There's going to be a transformation in the twinkling of an eye. The old corruption is going to put on new glory. And oh, what's the whole point? The point is verse 58. It's the end of the whole chapter. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't stop now, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Just one more day, go for it. What if you gave God just one more day each morning? All he wants is that day. Well, what if I wake up the next day? Just give him just that day. Well, what if... What if what? What if, what if I live my whole life that way? What if you live your whole life for the Lord? <laughs> How amazing! Worst case scenario, you live a godly life for the Lord. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, okay. How it's going to be, how it's going to happen quick, and it's to him, it's personal. He's going to receive us to himself. What will it be like? Oh, transformation and glory, peace that truly will be lasting. Well, when? Well, let's go. Uh, the story is my, my brother-in-law, when he was very little, was at a crusade and went forward to give his life to the Lord. He was going to go to heaven, so mom and sister and family and prays to accept the Lord, and he opens his eyes, and he's like, we're still here. <laughs> yes, we're still here, for now. For now, we're still here. Well, Jesus you, you said you're coming back for us to receive us to yourself. When? Matthew chapter 24, we'll be there in a moment, but if you want to go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, the question's asked. That same letter, that little young church was asking these questions, and Paul says, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, this moment that's to come, so comes as a thief in the night. You're not going to see it coming. Not as clearly as you want. For when they, oh, now we're talking about somebody else. This is not the church. This is everyone outside of faith. For when they say, peace and safety, everything's great, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. You're not going to get out of it. And they shall not escape. But, different group of people, you, brethren, you're not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. We're what's taken. Nothing's taken from us. We're what's taken from the world. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us, God's people, let us who are of the day be sober, start to think clearly, put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or we sleep, we should live together with him. And then he closes it up. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Boy, what a moment. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you, you don't need to know. It's going to be clear. Have you guys seen some of the trees just getting a hint of red? Well, what day is the fall going to begin? I don't know, but it's on its way. 
What day is Jesus coming? If everyone ever tells you, I know when he's coming, they are a deceiver or have been deceived or both. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven. Only the heavenly Father knows. No one knows the day or the hour. Says who? Jesus. Jesus. But you'll know the signs and the times. Matthew 24, Jesus talking specifically about this topic. And you were healer of wars and rumors of wars. Anybody hearing about wars and rumors of wars? Oh, yes, indeed. See that you are not troubled. Yeah, I, I just, the sovereign hand of God, so many times he tells us what we need, but we don't know we need it till tomorrow. You know that? Remember last week we talked about in Ephesians, it says that God's people, a healthy church is strong in the mind, not easily tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and taken advantage of by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. The next day, Someone started sending me information. I was like, oh, can you confirm this is true? And then it started to explode on media. COVID's coming back. You see that? By the middle of September, we're going to mask up in the airplanes, and by Christmas, we'll be doing full protocol and quarantines again. Now, hey, hang on. Real quick, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on. I promise to not freak out. I promise to trust in the Lord and to look for the glorious appearing. You're good. You're fine. Like, well, did you hear? Yeah. But the Lord might come back now. What if he doesn't? We'll be fine. We'll be okay. Well, do you know what else is going on? I don't know. I don't even know anymore. Boy, thank you, Photoshop and AI, for ruining everything. I know we're supposed to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. And through the power of prayer, we don't have to be bound up by anxiousness, but we can live in the peace of God that surpasses understanding. And we're to comfort each other as often as we can with the idea that at any minute he could come back and receive us to himself. If we do that, we're fine. Wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not troubled. And all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation. It means nationality against nationality. How on earth? That can't happen again. <laughs> kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. Look purely, because you just promised not to freak out, right? Many of you guys have probably seen this, but do you know back when Obama was president, and don't care... This is just a timestamp. That's all it is. I'm serious. Okay. Oh, actually. Oh, boy. I'm supposed to be ending, and I'm about to take off. You are aware that next year is an election year. Don't get lost in it. Be aware of it. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Make your voice count, all of it. But don't get lost in it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If we hate people because they don't like who we want to vote for and we let other people's hatred cause us to revenge, Jesus says, don't you dare. Give way to wrath. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The church cannot be defined by who we want to win every four years. We're defined by Christ. But years ago, just a time stamp, Obama was president. For the first time ever, policies were drafted and adopted where it was now legal for the first time in American history for the government to use propaganda against its own citizens. They can make up stories to change the mind of the country. Right? Um, but you promise not to freak out. You've probably seen this. Do you have the video ready? Yep, right on. Check Unfortunately, some members of the media... Some members of the media... Some members of the media... Some, some members of the media use, use their, their platforms to push their own personal bias. To, to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. Yes, it is extremely dangerous to our republic. Um, why are you showing us that? So you don't get lost in the weeds. Is COVID coming, not coming? I don't know. This is what I know. Jesus is coming. And this is what I know. 
my heavenly father is really good. And his ways are not my ways, that's true. And his thoughts are not my thoughts. But oh my, are they better. Don't lose your mind in the culture. Keep your mind fixed on things above where Christ is. We'll end with this. All the way back to where we began, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. It's just a question. Today, look, if, if somehow you are a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, and you're like, what is that? You used to walk with the Lord. Like, you used to actually enjoy church and, and, and talk to the Lord, and, and, and it's been a long time since you have. You've gone and sampled the world. The seasons are changing. And the Lord's calling you home. If you don't know the Lord, the peace that we talk about, you're like, man, I don't have that. You can. Man, when I die, I don't know what's going to happen to me. You can. John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Maybe you're like Thomas in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, uh, <clears throat> we don't know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Look, what if, what if the Lord doesn't come back in this lifetime? then you will die of something. It happens to everybody. But either you will die in the Lord, and thus it'll just be, hey, we'll see you later. We'll meet you in the clouds. Or you will wait for your final resurrection before the judge. Or, the Bible says, all who are willing to confess him as Lord, all who believe in their heart, that Christ has been risen from the dead, shall be saved. If you're at a place today, and it's been a long time since you've been walking with the Lord, I'm just, as lovingly as I can tell you, it's time to start. Come home. What are you waiting for? You, by now you've realized the world is not as fancy as it dresses itself up to be. And if you don't have that peace and that hope, and you know if you died today, you're in trouble. Jesus died for your, your not sent your sins that you would have eternal hope but you have to make a decision to by faith accept him as your lord and savior or today you're choosing to reject him be careful let's pray lord it's so beyond our understanding why you would love us we see what's in the mirror we know our own story and it's not that impressive and yet you so loved us you gave your only begotten son and lord you so love us your desires that we would be with you in heaven God, I ask for those today that are doing well. They're walking with you. Lord, we're not perfect, but they're walking with you. They're doing it. Lord, just be their strength. Encourage them. Keep them going. Those that it's time to come back. Lord, would they enjoy the next hour and day and week? Would anything that could forecast the illusion of shame or guilt just be removed from their life? And my friend, today, if you would say, I'm giving my life to the Lord. I'm done playing my own game. Then in your own words, you need to tell him something like, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've fallen short. 
but I believe and trust that Jesus is Lord and that he has been raised from the dead. And if you confess that to him, your sins are washed away forever. The Bible says you are adopted into the family of God. Church, if you would stand, we're going to close in this song, and it's a glorious song. Maybe the Lord will come back in the middle of it. That'd be awesome. But today, look, if you're coming back to the Lord, we would love to pray over you, encourage you, build you up. If you have questions about life and salvation, we would love to just share with you what God has revealed. There'll be people up here to talk and pray with you, but whatever you do, church, do as unto the Lord with all your hearts.